So, um, hello. Uh, I'll be speaking about uh, Fluence and, and uh, uh, TSS for the rescue of decentralization. So, Fluence is a decentralized serverless compute platform. Uh, basically, what does it mean? Uh, what does decentralized mean? It means distributed, trustless, unstoppable, fault tolerant, and so on. Uh, and uh, it's a compute platform, uh, which means that uh, Fluence replicates, in a sense, the cloud stack, so that building decentralized applications from scratch uh, becomes much more easy. And uh, Fluence's uh, objective uh, is to enable running arbitrary code without limitations with a similar speed uh, and utility as the cloud. So we want to run general purpose applications. Uh, and we want to run them anywhere, on the edge, locally, in the browser, on the backend. Uh, no consensus required, it's optional, uh, and that means that we have a highly performed computation, uh, which is quite cheap. Uh, it's asynchronous, so you can use parallelism uh, on the network uh, heavily. And uh, uh, it's compatible with a multiple data uh, IO, uh, you can read, uh, right from different protocols, chains, uh, like IPFS, Filecon, Arweave, L1, L2, and so on. And compute platform begins with the compute marketplace. So let's begin the Fluence overview with uh, uh, the Web3 compute marketplace. Uh, Fluence network runs on a decentralized compute marketplace so that anyone can contribute compute capacity uh, which means that it's an open protocol, and the open protocol eliminates switching costs between providers. And with no switching costs, uh, there is a competition, and compute costs are dry, driven down. And it allows uh, the risk in the application, as uh, there is no provider lock-in, uh, there is no API to shut off, uh, there is no means to uh, censor data and to check what can or cannot run uh, on the network. So the entry barriers to uh, distributed or decentralized applications or for, to create uh, multi-party pro protocols and run them in the wild reduced. Uh, what does the compute marketplace uh, look like? Uh, we have uh, the on-chain part, so compute marketplace runs on, on the chain. Uh, currently it's uh, a Filecoin. And uh, uh, we have the off-chain part, so the compute itself happens off-chain. We have compute providers. We expect them to run a lot of servers. Uh, each server is represented uh, in the marketplace uh, with the offer, uh, with uh, some attributes for uh, the compute jobs that can run on these servers, like uh, the pricing and uh, advanced capabilities. And uh, uh, developer can choose uh, the pricing policy what external I.O. is required, like uh, if I need DPU, I will take uh, providers uh, uh, given DPU. If I need uh, uh, calling HTTPS, uh, I will ask provider to give this capability and so on. Then uh, I can choose uh, how many compute providers to take, uh, how many peers uh, to take from each of the providers. I can whitelist and blacklist providers for deal uh, inclusion or exclusion. Uh, and uh, finally, it looks uh, like this. I have a deal transaction uh, that I want to put my application on the network. It goes to the compute marketplace. Uh, and uh, uh, the matching happens. So uh, some of the peers allocate the resources here represented as workers, uh, the gray workers on three of the peers. And uh, uh, these workers are registered into the uh, on-chain deal, uh, so we can find the part of the infrastructure uh, that will be running our jobs, uh, our application, our protocol on the network. If uh, the peer goes down, then as all the criteria are kept on chain, uh, the new peer will appear. Uh, that's why we call it a serverless uh, platform a decentralized serverless because you don't need to care about particular servers. Uh, and uh, uh, once it's deployed, 
uh, it forms a subnet, and let's speak a little about the subnets. So here we have uh, those three peers uh, with uh, workers, so it's our part of the network, uh, and uh, it's a subnet, and subnet is constituted by the user code deployed on the workers on many peers, and this uh, code consists of WebAssembly services running with uh, uh, the Marine runtime, and uh, uh, the multi-party flows between these, uh, uh, all these peers, all these workers, and uh, maybe the user uh, running with Aqua. So uh, we can have this uh, Fluence stack comparison with the cloud. Uh, it's very, very rough. Uh, so for AWS, Lambda, uh, for uh, local compute jobs, we have Marine. For step functions and distributed flows, we have uh, Aqua. And for uh, the emergent behaviors, like load balancing, routing, scaling, orchestration, deploy, uh, we have Aqua libraries. So all these behaviors are not the part of the protocol. They are scriptable, pluggable. Uh, they don't require recompiling or redeploying the network uh, to be updated. So it's uh, a very open infrastructure. A few words about Aqua. Aqua is a multi-party language that manages a distributed execution flow. And you can use Aqua to invoke subnet services and also to extend subnet functionality to add consensus if needed to do load balancing replication or to implement the multi-party part of multi-party computation. And here's a, a small snippet of what is possible with uh, uh, Aqua. Uh, here we have a, a four cycle with a parallelism. We have types. Uh, then after four with parallelism, it's actually fork pattern. Uh, when you fork the execution flow onto several peers. And then we have join. Uh, we can do timeouts and so on. So it's quite powerful uh, and very straightforward because it's a kind of a domain specific language. And uh, uh, this Aqua acts as an ephemeral coordinator or it forms a protocol fundamentally. Every execution is a kind of a protocol. Uh, there is no single party who runs this Aqua. It flows from peer to peer. So um, no single party that's nice, and no blockchain involved at the same time. No blockchain, uh, off-chain, very, very efficient, no blockchain. So fundamentally, Aqua language and Marine Runtime serves as a, a tool set to make multi-party protocols. You do uh, the compute part, uh, the library code, uh, into the language that compiles to WebAssembly or, or that can run uh, on WebAssembly. And you uh, deploy, provision, uh, maintain, update, redeploy, orchestrate with Aqua and Marine. MPC uh, and like TSS is a very good example of what exactly can be coordinated this way. So let's take a look at MPC. For MPC, we collaborate with uh, uh, the Silence Labs. So I ask Sushi to. And thanks, Dimitri. I feel short standing next to Dimitri. <laughs> Anyways, hi, uh, I'm Sushi. I'm a applied cryptographer at Silence Labs. I focus on writing the libraries and helping our clients use it in their solutions. So yeah, so I was unsure of the audience for this talk, so bear with me for a quick introduction to MPC. Uh, so yeah, so it's MPC, we have multiple parties. They have secrets. They want to compute some function together over the data, and they want to give it private. That's it, that's my overview for MPC. And uh, today, I wanna to talk about a subset of MPC, that is threshold signature schemes, and which usually comes, with, usually comes with three functions that it supports. So first is distributed key generation, also known as DKG commonly, and distributed sign generation and key refresh. So using our rigorous math notation that we established earlier, so distributed key generation, the function that we're evaluating is key generation, just creating a new key, and the output is a share for each party, and the share can, depending on the protocol, can be additive or Shamir secret shares. So the private data that each party is providing to the protocol is um, just random data that they have sampled. So an, an interesting thing with MPC protocols, we have this um, notion of key refresh, where you can run a protocol to refresh or re-randomize your key shares. 
And uh, yeah, that's the function uh, that's being run for key refresh. And the input is the current key share that the party holds. And for distributed sign generation, we run any signing algorithm. And in this uh, common use, uh, commonly used is ECDSA and EDDSA. And uh, it outputs a valid signature. And we give the key share that we have uh, after DKG. OK, so I just want to show how it looks in practice. Um, uh, this is specific to a two-party case. And just a simple sequence diagram uh, to showcase how the flow looks. It's just a very simple like ping pong uh, messaging, where party one starts it off by creating a message one, and party two processes it, and then they go back and forth for two rounds. And in the end, you have a sign or a key share. This is just a rough overflow. Uh, don't, it's not accurate uh, with the rounds and everything. Just wanted to show it. OK, so yeah, so this is just a code example I wanted to show, to uh, show a library and how easy it is to use. So I basically want to make MPC easy to use, and someone who they don't have to understand how it works entirely to, be, to use it. So um, this is just doing um, sign generation in, in six lines. It's all happening locally. Do not recommend doing this. Uh, but yeah, in a practical setting, the parties will be in hopefully uh, very far away from each other. But yeah, this is how easy it is to you know, do, uh, do distributed sign generation. OK, so state of threshold signatures as uh, silence labs. Uh, we have our two-party library. It's written in Rust. We expose a C API, WASM API, a TypeScript package, or any other language you need. We'll, we'll get it done. And these are some uh, numbers for keygen and sign. And for our multi-party library, we also have a Rust library. We expose all sorts of APIs and any other wrapper you require. And these are our initial uh, preliminary benchmarks. And um, I'm very happy with these numbers, and we're already working on a bunch of optimizations, and I, 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 I'm, I'm sure it'll get better over time. OK, so now what? We have a library. We make it easy to use. What do we do next? So now, when we come to the real setting, we have a lot of problems, like how, how do parties authenticate with each other? How is the communication done? Right? Like, so what are the guarantees of the communication layer? Where is compute done? Who hosts that, and how does that work? So we've been looking at alternate solutions for this uh, for, a, for a few months now. And you'll see a bunch of talks later. And while, while doing the research for this, we came across Fluence. And we were kind of interested in what they can do together with MPC. So yeah, so I think Dimitri will show you like what uh, we were able to do with uh, Fluence. Yeah, over to him. Hello. Uh, can we switch to, to Zoom? Uh, wonderful. Yeah, it works. So um, let's discuss protocols on Aqua and take uh, two-party TSS MPC as an example. So we are going to uh, allocate two servers as uh, two parties, uh, or uh, even better, we will allocate four servers to replicate each party's shares. Uh, we'll have two copies on different uh, peers. Uh, we already allocated workers on the network, uh, so we have a subnet, and now we want to generate key shares, generate signature for an Ethereum address, and rotate the, 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 the shares. So these steps will complete the TCS uh, lifecycle. So let's begin with uh, generating the key shares. Here's uh, uh, the sequence diagram of what, what's going to happen in the very first demo. It's almost the same that Susha shown, uh, but with this uh, party of init peer, that's uh, uh, the CLI that uh, I'm going to be running uh, that just shows what's going to happen. And uh, um, fundamentally, this is uh, the aqua code that I'm going to run, and this is the demo one. I'm going to write something to the console locally. It uh, uh, happens locally. Then I run uh, the keygen round trip function. And I'm going to use uh, Fluency CLI for it. Fluency CLI handles all uh, the setup for the Fluence application. So it connected to the peer, and uh, uh, it done uh, the key generation. So uh, let's take a look on the Aqua code that was executed. I need to command click. So uh, we created uh, the parties. Uh, we got the workers from the get workers uh, helper. And then it's uh, 
so straightforward. You see, I move the execution. Uh, the next block is going to be executed on, on the first worker. And this happens on the first worker. I get the variable uh, from the key gen, uh, round zero. Then uh, uh, I print some blocks to the console. I do it uh, in non-blocking fashion with co, which means uh, coroutine. Then I go to the second party. I use the data from the first party. I do logs. I finalize uh, the key generation for the first party. Here it is. I finalize uh, key generation for the second party. Here it is. I do some assignments and uh, like logs, uh, these, these logs here. So it's extremely straightforward. It's the same uh, sequence diagram, but uh, following all the arrows. I'm just follow the arrows in, in a single script. It's not divided into different parties. I don't need to recompile it. It's a scripting language. Uh, it compiles on the fly. Uh, so I don't know a simpler way to do multi-party part of uh, MPC, given the library is provided. But uh, actually, this uh, makes a little sense because uh, the key share is not uh, persisted. I just show it in the console and then drop, drop away. So let's switch to the second demo uh, to have uh, replication and persistence. It's just uh, the demo two. Uh, this is the demo two. I'm going to uh, set two shares among four peers and uh, it returns an Ethereum address. Uh, we can take a look on the code. Uh, so we collect different workers for different services. Uh, uh, we deployed several subnets, fundamentally. We have a lot of workers. We use functions uh, which form a MPC TSS library, which is also reusable. Uh, then we get uh, the Ethereum address. Uh, and uh, we check that everything is okay with uh, this fork joint pattern. If uh, it takes more than five seconds to complete, then it timeouts, so pretty nice. Now we have this uh, Ethereum address uh, created, and uh, uh, we have uh, key shares of this Ethereum address persisted. So let's uh, check uh, that the shares for this address actually exist with a new call. Uh, we take the Ethereum address as an argument uh, because uh, our signing service implementation uh, can store many shares for different addresses uh, and uh, create signatures for different addresses uh, based on what you want. So it shows the shares in the console of course, it's made for demo purpose. Uh, you will not want to uh, provide uh, the shares uh, in the open form uh, through the API, but it's just to, to show that it actually works. It's super straightforward. So that was uh, the key gen example. Uh, and we did the key gen, then we did key gen with persistence, and uh, uh, then we checked uh, the key shares. Now let's make a signature. So um, in our setup, uh, the services deployed uh, on all the peers are the same. So they can play both roles. Uh, you have two-party TSS creation. Uh, they can be of the first role and uh, on the second role. And we have a lot of small services on different subnets. Uh, you can make a fat service. You can make a lot of small services. They are very cheap in deployment. And Fluence supports all the approaches. Um, so let's take a look on the signature creation. Uh, we have uh, here the message to sign, the Ethereum address, and the der derivation path. Let's uh, use it. And uh, hope uh, that it will uh, sign everything. So we have the signature here. Uh, we have some logs. It also works and is quite fast. So Aqua coordinates uh, MPC signature creation as well. 
At this point, I want to take a side note on the protocol security. Uh, just a few words. We have a lot of considerations uh, on the security of the uh, protocol and what exactly we provide uh, with the protocol for the developers. But the baseline, uh, we have end-to-end -end encryption on lib 2 p level. We use uh, lib 2 p for uh, networking. Uh, and the Aquaflow execution uh, itself, as there is no coordinator, it means that execution is moved from peer to peer and every next peer verifies all the previous steps. Uh, of, of the flow. So if the flow is violated, then uh, this violation can be proved on chain. So the stake can be slashed, the stake of the peer, of the malicious peer that uh, changed, the, changed the data uh, or like uh, removed the data from the previous steps or do, did, did something like that. Uh, for the peer level security, uh, we have TEE in development. Uh, that means that right now, uh, the shares are stored uh, in the open form uh, in the file system, but we are working on TE. Uh, and uh, to provide resilience, uh, you need to distribute work. Uh, if you have sensitive data, if you want not to lose it and so on, it's better to have a subnet. That's why the unit of deployment is a subnet, not just one peer, one service. And uh, uh, they should collaborate uh, to provide uh, the required service level. And uh, uh, for security inside uh, the services, uh, you can authenticate with a peer ID, you can authenticate with uh, capabilities uh, like Kakao or signatures, or you can use MPC signatures from other subnets so that one subnet can be authorized with MPC uh, to trigger some execution on another subnet. So, um, Okay, we have keygen, uh, we have a signature creation, let's uh, rotate the key shares and let's regenerate the key shares and ensure that the Ethereum address is the same, is the fifth demo. It will also locate uh, all the peers, storing the shares, uh, the signing workers, the keygen workers, uh, and we'll uh, take uh, the key shares uh, of signing workers to uh, keygen refresh uh, functions. And uh, there are multiple rounds, many round trips between uh, the parties, uh, everything orchestrated with uh, Aqua. So a lot of things happening here. We have Web3 utilities uh, to generate Ethereum address back from the public key and so on, a lot of things. Uh, all of them are reusable, and the Aquaflow itself is reusable. You can use it as library and uh, like for other purposes. So that's pretty nice. And another nice thing is that um, for rotating the keys, right now I did uh, press uh, the intro button. Like I have this fluency light, and I trigger the flow uh, pushing the button. But you can do uh, it uh, automated way with spells. So Fluence uh, has a concept of spells. Spells are aqua functions running periodically on the workers. Uh, so they are like cron jobs with some additions. Uh, they are distributed multi-party cron because aqua is distributed. Uh, they have a key, key value store uh, to retain intermediary data uh, to store it between the calls. Uh, and uh, also spells execution can be triggered not just by uh, the timer, but uh, by blockchain events as well. And uh, uh, given that we have MPC on decentralized network in such a pluggable and composable, uh, customizable way, uh, what it enables? Uh, we can do a lot of multi-party algorithms the same way. Uh, and uh, uh, we can use many subnets of different uh, behaviors, different capabilities in a single aqua flow. For example, uh, we can take Fluence RPC, uh, which provides uh, distributed access to blockchain data that, uh, uh, that's another demo that we have, to read the blockchain data. Uh, then we can deploy a subnet for data analysis that takes the data from uh, RPCs and make some decision uh, based on the uh, on-chain events. And then we can sign a transaction with MPC uh, and uh, 
send it on chain with proofs for the source data and uh, uh, for the decision uh, being made uh, by authorized parties and do some composition like this, uh, do some pipelines. So it could look like this when we have uh, uh, different subnets and uh, we can have a blockchain on the left, blockchain on the right, uh, it could be different blockchains. Uh, we can uh, push uh, execution to the web browser as well uh, as we can run Fluence Pure in the web browser. So that's quite powerful. And a few words about the next steps uh, and where we are. Um, we have developer experience flow and the compute providers flow. Uh, for the developer experience, uh, we want to have two-party and n-party MPC available for all the Fluence subnets. Uh, that's uh, currently, uh, you need to speak to Silent Labs uh, to get this uh, demo working for you. And uh, we want to speed up uh, MPC uh, and uh, different cryptography uh, solutions with the native GMP and crypto modules uh, for WebAssembly. Uh, right now it's all happens in WebAssembly, which is quite slow, we can optimize. Uh, we want uh, to have a very fine-grained encryption, peer-to-peer -peer encryption uh, on the level of services. We want to have a secret management SDK to prevent uh, user errors um, which could lead to, to secret uh, leaking. And we are working on TE for WebAssembly modules. But fundamentally, given that uh, we can expect us to deliver all of this, uh, all the tool set already works. Uh, we have the testnet uh, deployed, we have several testnets, uh, so you can develop things uh, right away. And for the compute provider flow, uh, I said that uh, the servers could have some capacity and you can get capacity and for the decentralized network, for sure, we cannot just trust compute providers to provide the capacity. Uh, so we measure this capacity with a proof of capacity, uh, which is a CPU and a RAM intense uh, proof of work. So we focus on CPU mainly. Uh, and we provide incentives for compute providers to provide capacity to the Fluence network. So we are going to bootstrap the mainnet in Q4 uh, with uh, uh, this proof of work for compute providers. And uh, uh, we are going to release uh, proof processing, uh, proof of uh, aqua execution, on-chain proof of uh, aqua execution in uh, Q1 uh, next year. So that was everything on my side. Thank you very much. See Fluence.network for more. Join Fluence.chat is our Discord and uh, ask me anything I'm around uh, on, on this event. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Those two demos I saw hand up there, one hand here. I have so many questions because this is tightly related to my research. Um, so first off, I'm curious about the, the TSS that you used and that, that you support. Uh, is there a particular TSS algorithm that you support and how did you choose that? Oh yeah, uh, we, we use Lindell 17 uh, for two-party and for uh, multi-party we use DKLS. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious, with the Fluence network, if we're going to apply TKLS on top of Fluence, I mean, the whole point of uh, a threshold signature scheme in any TSS is that, you know, if you have uh, corruptions or, or an adversary that uh, takes over a part of the network, then you're fine. But if everything is going through Fluence, like even if you might have multiple parties underneath, uh, if somebody were to either plant a black door or do something with the Fluence network, what prevents uh, such an adversary from taking over more than your threshold uh, of your workers and, and basically breaking the TSS game? Uh, the point is that uh, you can whitelist providers and you can pick different providers uh, ensuring that there is no more than given number of servers from every provider. Uh, we incentivize uh, uh, economically providers uh, to uh, compose the proofs so it's much more efficient if the proofs of capacity and proof processing are composed into a single proof uh, before sending it uh, 
on chain. So probably, highly likely, uh, uh, from the economically perspective, perspective, uh, it's uh, uh, very reasonable uh, to have the real providers registered as desync providers. So um, if the economical uh, incentive is not enough for you to ensure the security, the replication between different data centers, if it's not enough for you, then you use whitelist uh, to make sure that you know the providers where it will be uh, distributed. That, that's great for the providers, but if everything is flowing through Fluence, what prevents Fluence from acting as that uh, malicious adversary? What kind of Fluence? It's uh, an open protocol. It, it, it ne never runs through any, fl like Fluence is providing all of this as a marketplace, but Mar does this data go through Fluence or no? Marketplace is running on chain, so it's decentralized, no Fluence in between. Fluence is a protocol. Fluence off-chain protocol has open incentives. It's an open protocol. Anyone can join, anyone can leave. Uh, it's uh, governed uh, uh, on-chain, so no Fluence guys in between. Thank you. Hey, so I have a question. Um, what does it take to integrate with, with, with Aqua? Like if I want to bring on a new, a new protocol, and how does it work technically? Is it based on JavaScript or uh, two questions, I guess? Yeah, so what it takes to integrate. Uh, you can uh, uh, try out one of our uh, quick starts, but you will end up with something like this. Uh, you install uh, Fluence CLI, you do Fluence init, and uh, uh, then you have Aqua folder and services folder, and in the services folder, uh, by default, uh, you have Rust code. And if you have a library that uh, could be compiled to WebAssembly, C, Neem, Rust, something like this, uh, you need to provide uh, a facade to it and do something like this. Uh, when you have a, a module that does just like definition of the public interface and uh, that ensures some uh, business invariants, uh, business rules, uh, like here we have uh, the marine um, macro that helps with uh, everything. So uh, for compute, if you want compute to be portable uh, and probably you want it to be portable so that it's safe uh, and nice for compute providers to run it without knowing who you are, and so on. Uh, then you need to compile it to WebAssembly. Uh, and uh, it's quite straightforward. Uh, we implement uh, WebAssembly interface types uh, specification. Uh, our services uh, could consist of many modules. So you can reuse uh, modules. You can reuse services uh, as whole, and so on. So after you have this. Uh, you have uh, the generated uh, aqua types for it. Uh, here, uh, this is auto-generated. You have uh, uh, the service name. You have all the functions, all the types, and the, uh, uh, you can from write the Rust bindings are auto auto generated from from what? From uh, the type definitions of uh, Rust from this yeah. uh, marine macro. I see. I see. Uh, but it's uh, not very custom. This marine macro creates interface types section in the WebAssembly file, and then we fetch uh, the definitions from WebAssembly time, uh, uh, WebAssembly interface types, uh, and uh, we have this. And after that, you can just create an Aqua file. Uh, probably you want to do Fluence dep install for some libraries that we provide or something else. And then you just begin writing if you want to, to, to have some output, you, you could just return. We have an aqua book uh, with documentation. Uh, you can learn it uh, while you're coding and playing with all of this. Uh, for, the, for the logs, uh, you can, like right now, it runs, um, it comes with uh, uh, the bundled in uh, Docker Compose file that runs uh, the local network. 
Uh, and uh, you can, uh, uh, if you use Docker uh, desktop, uh, you can see the logs uh, and see what's happening to debug. So everything is here. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I have a question. Uh, so breach of privacy is not detectable, right? In uh, Fluence. So for example, if I have my private key in the servers and they somehow reconstruct it and use it in, in some other system, then uh, you cannot hold them accountable because it is basically also indistinguishable from the case where I am actually trying to frame you leaking my private key. Uh, so the question is, uh how could we prevent leaking of the private key or, or of the shares, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, why I, I had this uh, slide on the very end about um, very fine-grained uh, encryption on the protocol level. And uh, where it was? Here. So uh, this is about three things fundamentally. The first thing is how exactly can I transfer uh, the, the secret, any, any kind of secret, from one peer to another peer, given that Aqua works in such a way that it needs an access to the data to do routing. So all the data by default is transparent to all the peers uh, on the flow. You need to explicitly uh, hide the secrets, and we are working on an end-to-end -end encryption scheme uh, that comes from one service to another service. Then the next question is uh, how exactly the secret is uh, stored and managed and used on the peer. Uh, we are working on secret management SDK. But finally, uh, the, the, the decryption of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, encrypted uh, message of, of the secret should happen only inside TEE. Uh, and uh, there is a T solution for WebAssembly modules that we are integrating. So finally, there will be no possibility for the secret leaking because uh, it will come to TEE and it will not be revealed in any form to the, to the peer. But today, you need to have some level of trust uh, while developing the solution uh, before we come to mainnet and before we have all of this implemented. Does it answer your question? Yeah, so uh, my, my, second, my second question was that, now suppose I also have the secret key, right? And okay. the secret key is also stored in your, in your network. So if there is a message that is signed with the secret key, how do you distinguish that it is me who is signing or the network is maliciously si signing? Okay, uh, and uh, f f for that... Yeah, so, she can... so the user does not have a key here. It's most of like a federated type of model. So that's also back to your original question. It's a valid question, right? We thought about it. I think we were just discussing it yesterday. So. It, we are already not, the user does not have a key share. We are already trusting that this network, you know, will at least have um, one honest party or majority honest parties. So, yeah, so, but we can try our best to make it difficult, but this is like a inherent drawback of user not having the keys. Thanks. And uh, uh, I, I would like to, to add a few words. So, I'm from Fluence, uh, Fluence Labs, like protocol uh, for compute. And, uh, uh, I'm speaking about Aqua Language and Marine Runtime as a tool set to make multi-party protocols. So I don't speak that we have solved all the security issues. We provide the tooling for the guys like you who can use it either to do bad things or good things. Uh, but you're just uh, the infrastructure. You can Hopefully run good things. on the infrastructure. Questions? Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Thank both you of you.